This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. In this episode, I speak with a writer, Honoré Corder. She talks to me about writing her first book in three days, the importance of building your list and learning to say no. Enjoy the episode. Hey, it's James Taylor. I'm delighted today to have Honoré Corder. She is the author of 20 books, including You Must Write a Book, Vision to Reality, Tall Order, The Successful Single Mom Book Series, and A Divorced Phoenix. She is also Hal Error's business partner in the Miracle Morning Book Series, which has been a huge hit. Honoré coaches business professionals, writers, and aspiring non-fiction authors who want to publish their books to bestseller status, create a platform, and develop multiple streams of income. She also does all sorts of other cool, magical things that we're going to hear about, and her bad arsery is legendary. So welcome to the show, Honoré. I'm delighted to be with you. Thank you for having me. So share with our listeners what's going on in your world just now. Well, let's see. I We just published three books in the Miracle Morning book series. So we did the Miracle Morning Artifact Affirmations coloring book for adults and kids. We just published the Miracle Morning for parents and families. And we also did a companion guide to the Miracle Morning for Network Marketers, which is the 90-day action planner. And then I'm putting the finishing touches um, on You Must Write a Book, and it comes out uh, in just uh, about 10 days' time. So you've got so all a little the, busy. You've got all these projects going on the go. Is that very normal for you? Is it very usual rather than having one book that you're working on that you have multiple projects and you're kind of switching between them? I usually have with how we do three to four books a year. So these three coming out right at the same time was an, uh, fortunately was an anomaly, <laughs> not the regular practice. And I normally have three books I'm working on of my own. So the book that I'm writing, the book that I'm cogitating over and the book that is yeah, pre-release. So I do maybe four to six books a year, depending on my production schedule and what else I have going on. So yeah, it's it's normal for me to be spinning plates and herding cats. That's kind of a normal thing. That's the thing. So when you came yeah. from, in terms of writing, b- before you came into the into the world of actually kind of writing your first book, you came from the world of kind of network marketing. Were there yeah. were there things that, you know? Are there things that you've very much taken across from the, your your experience in network marketing to working now as as an author and as a coach of authors? Oh, that's a great question. I no one's ever asked me that before. The I think the answer is absolutely yes. The, the thing about being successful in network marketing or any traditional business or in writing is there's has to be a commitment and a practice of consistency that is a a, a thread that follows you through. So in network marketing, it's, you know, 10 calls a day and making the ask and following up, following up, following up. And in traditional business, it's making 10 calls a day and following up consistently. And in the writing business, um, it's consistently writing and it's also consistently making the ask. And in, in place of 10 calls a day, you're probably posting on several different social media sites and, and reaching out to podcasts to be interviewed and perhaps blogging and, and asking people to buy your book. So the, it's it's uh, identifying the best practices that are going to move the needle and doing those consistently. And it's not sexy or exciting, but it sure does get the job done. And and how did you, when you kind of went from that with the world of network marketing into becoming a really as a, as a writer, how did you first start kind of developing your craft? How did you kind of get to that point where writing was was a, a daily ritual was was something that you were doing consistently? Oh gosh, so that there's a lot of years in there in between um well first of all you use the word writing craft and you said it more lovely than I say it. Um <laughs> but um I don't think there was any craft involved. It, initially I didn't know to have a craft. <laughs> so let's start with that. Um kind of to be speaking to the person who's just getting started and wondering what the heck is going on, right? The, the writing craft is a thing, everybody. Um, when I transitioned out of network marketing, I was actually transitioning into business coaching and speaking and training and, um, writing a book was then the next natural thing that I was told to do. And so I wrote my first book, but I wasn't particularly worried about craft. What I was focused on was having something to replace my business card, give me some credibility, allow me to increase my fees, do some marketing, 
those sorts of things. It wasn't until maybe six or seven books in after I clearly had gotten the bug of publishing, self-publishing that, um, I recognized that uh, through working with editors that I, there was a cra- there was craft, <laughs> there was craft involved and that maybe I should pay attention to that and, and really focus on, becoming a better writer. And with every draft of a manuscript that was returned to me, I would be in school every time learning about the rules that you don't just put a comma any old place that <laughs> it has to have a reason and the rules around the semicolon and run on sentences and all of those things. And so I'm still in school I'm 20, 21 books in and, and still, still learn every single time I get a manuscript back for sure. And how long for that, that very, very first book that you wrote, how long was the gestation period, the period of you going from, I'm, I want to write a book to actually, let's say, getting that first draft done? Well, I didn't actually have the I want to write a book. I was given the you must write a book by Mark Victor Hansen. So I met him and, and listeners would know him as the co-author of the Chicken Soup for the Soul book series. And I met him at an event and he said, what do you do? And I was very proud of myself. And I, you know, kind of did a hair flip and I was like, oh, I'm a coach and a speaker. And he was not impressed (laughs) with, with my answer. He said, everybody's a coach and a speaker. You better write a book. You must write a book. And I I guess the blank stare on my face caused him to continue because he felt sorry for me. And he basically said, if you have a speech that you've given that's popular, you've given over and over that people like, turn that into your book, write that down. And so the gestation period was I went from that conference, which was in October, I went home. I'm more of a doer than a, um, a cogitator. And so I literally sat down and over the course of three days time, turned that speech into my first rough draft manuscript. And the word rough here is in bold and it has sparkles on it. <laughs> You, it was right. the, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was just me, uh, kind of vomiting on the paper, getting like pretending that I was talking to an audience, but literally talking through my fingers. And that was the first rough draft of my manuscript. And then I w- was sick of it because when you do anything for three straight days, I don't know about you, but I want to take a break from it. So I took a break for a few months, and then I came back to it, and I hired someone who had published a book to work with me on the some of the particulars of publishing that book. And as it turns out, he didn't know some of the particulars either. (laughs) So um, my first effort wasn't sterling and resulted in a bonfire sometime later (laughs) when I, when I realized what was missing and did the, the makeover of the book. And um, so that whole process took me probably six or eight months before it was finished so you're, you're known as well um obviously with your work with hal uh, but your own, own work of writing in in series in kind of series you you often uh, i've noticed in, in your writing that there's a there's a theme that kind of goes on mm-hmm. it carries over a number of books with that very first book did you have that and were you thinking you know um uh harry potter style you know <laughs> this is going to be a three no, series not- thing i was like i just need to get this stuff out of my head onto the page so i have something as a as a calling card as a business card Yes, I would love to say that I am, you know, behind the curtain with this grand um, strategy from the very beginning. And actually, no, it was more of the latter. I I just need to have Mark Victor Hansen says have a book and I'm going to have a book, everybody. And so I I had a book and that was it. I didn't write again. I didn't write. I didn't write again at all. And I and I barely was blogging. Um, and I didn't write a book again until 2009. So between 2004 and 2009, I didn't really write at all. And then I started um, working on my next book, which again was a- accidental and not um, had no uh, strategy or or intention behind it. I, but then I realized I could write a series in that book, but it wasn't from a strategic perspective. It was more um, in the book I'm referring to, the second book that I wrote is called The Successful Single Mom, which became a six book series, all nonfiction. Um, I just realized there were certain problems that single moms had, problems that I had as a single mom that I solved. And so I decided to write books around each of those challenges and how I solved those problems myself. But I think what, what you said just at the start there as well, where you were talking about 
you know, not feeling necessarily you were a writer, but kind of coming to it later. Um, it, it, you know, you weren't one of these people that straight from college or something went out and I'm mm-hmm. going to be the great American novelist or I'm going to be, you know, <laughs> you you weren't that, that person. It was very much, okay, this is something to do. But did is that first book, was that maybe a, a challenge? Did Have you ever felt kind of really bitten by the, 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 the bug of writing or is writing very much for you? It's about just getting getting your ideas out, and you're quite happy when the book is finished, and it's and it's away, and you can go on to the next thing. Oh, I absolutely love it now. I actually have writer on my business card. I I'm enthralled with the book business and the process, and I love birthing the books. Now, not every minute, <laughs> <laughs> not not every minute of the process is joyful, and you know, fairy tales and and unicorns, but for the most part, I really do love it. And as I'm publishing one book right now, I have three or four more book ideas that I haven't even written down that are just kind of running around, plus the list of books that I have already written down that I want to write. I definitely, I, I got bit by the bug and I definitely have the fever for sure. And something you're, you're known for, um, and you, you know, you coach a lot of artists on is around self-publishing. So rather than um, do you know the find an agent book proposal etc and publisher um how we are now writers are now empowered to be able to self publish mm-hmm. um when when you were kind of first starting is that how you kind of you went straight into the kind of self publishing thing or did you go the traditional route and then kind of come to self publishing later on i didn't i i did not fancy myself a writer i did not go to college i didn't have a journalism degree i thought that agents and publishing companies were for capital w writers and i certainly wasn't one so i didn't even try the traditional publishing route at all i just self-published i just figured it out and um i've always stuck with self-publishing and by the time um by the time that it was even a conversation like I went, oh, some people still are holding out for the agent and the and the traditional publishers. I'm already doing okay, <laughs> so um, I haven't I haven't ever really tried traditional publishing. I know I have lots of friends who have been trad and come to self publishing, and some have started self publishing and then gone trad. and And I think every single person has a a recipe or a formula that works best for them. I like being in con- complete control of the manuscript and and the artistic expression, getting my book covers done and working with the editor and that sort of thing. I don't know that I would do well with just turning over a manuscript and hoping for the best. And, and I'm sensing also speed of the idea of you having the idea to kind of getting out there is, is quite important to you. So, and I imagine going, if you'd gone the traditional publishing route, um, that whole process is very elongated, um, where with the self-publishing, you can have the idea and you can, you know, work on the thing and you can get it out in a, in a relatively quick idea and then move on to the next, the next thing in, in the, in the kind of series as well. Um, when, when you, you start work, I know you, you spend a lot of time now speaking, um, at, at, at conference and speaking to other writers and, and aspiring writers as well. Um, what are some of the, the, what are some of the kind of questions when you go and speak at those events and the kind of Q and A's or when people kind of come up to you afterwards, they, they felt a little bit embarrassed about saying something, but they, you know, over a cup of coffee, they'll come up to you and ask a question about writing. What are, are most of the questions about the, as I mentioned, like the craft or is it about the, the marketing of it or is it something else? They, they are interested in my perspective on having a book that is indistinguishable from traditional publishing in terms of quality. So they're interested to know how I maintain a speed of publication and yet still dot the I's and cross the T's so that when someone holds the book, when they're reading the book, it feels as though it could have come out of New York. Mm. And, and, and what it, did I do to, to what do I do to make that happen? How, how does that happen exactly? That's what they want to know. And then, of course, they want to know how to be a full time writer. And so as, as you've, kind of de- you've developed that is, is, is for you, is, is it quite is it quite process orientated then? You, you know, you have a you have a, a kind of model and a process and you just every time you're just trying to tweak it and improve it and, and make it you know, smoother and make it better. Uh, is, is that what you're focusing a lot of your time about? So like thinking about the the the, the almost thinking more like a, a, a publisher in, in some ways than, than than a writer. Yes. So that well, there's definitely different phases of a project. There's the idea phase. There's making the idea concrete and deciding how I'm going to express it. So what's the book idea? What's the problem the book is going to solve or the solution the book is going to offer? What's the pain I'm going to help the reader avoid or the pleasure I'm going to help them get or both? 
what all needs to be covered in the book and what doesn't need to be covered in this particular book and could it go into a separate volume, something like that. And then there's the writing process, which is the creative, the creative piece for me. And simultaneously, while I'm in that creative process and making all of those decisions, I'm also commissioning covers and releasing the outline to the copywriter so that the book description can be made and scheduling the editor and scheduling the the layout and design person so that the book has the look and feel of a professionally published book or is pro- or is professionally published it's just professionally self published and then at some point we sw- we downshift into marketing <laughs> like <laughs> how are we going to sell this kid to the public? Right. So, um, what has to happen for all of those things to happen? So it's, it's a, I think it's a ballet actually. It's a carefully choreographed ballet that when it goes well, it's wonderful. And when it doesn't go well, it's still pretty wonderful. <laughs> and then it one ends thing, up okay. And one of the things you did with Tall Order, I, I, I remember reading a, a piece with you before and, um, you, you, you were very good or pr- probably from your, your network marketing days as well about, getting these pre-orders in uh, and, and kind of pre-selling something as well. And I would imagine that that's something that a lot of um, first, first-time first writers kind of struggle with. Uh, um, are, there, are there any things that you, 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 any kind of tips that you tend to to give to um, to writers about once you've kind of got, you've kind of got the book, it's almost ready to go and you want to start now in that marketing phase, you know, those hundred days or how long the, the, the period is going to be. Are there any things that you're, you're suggesting to, for that writer to be thinking about and to be setting up. Yes. And it actually happens. The, I say the very minute you have a book idea, start to build your list. And I know I'm not going to say anything that every other person hasn't said, but the, the power of an author is their relationships. The friendships they have with other authors and other writers is just the beginning. Ultimately it's the relationships you have with the readers When you have a book idea, you want to vet that book idea with prospective readers. Is this a book that you would read? Would you like to read my book? Ultimately, would you like to buy my book? So the marketing begins much earlier than the book is almost finished. Um, Because I have this machine, I know at what point to drop the book in. And when I start talking about the book, it's almost... um, instinctual at this point, but for a new author, when I'm actually working with someone, I have a very small clientele of professionals who are looking to write their first book or even have their book written, but we're going to market it for them. The One of the very first things that we talk about, and it's a continuing theme, is how are they building their list? How are they connecting with prospective readers? Are What kind of marketing are they doing in terms of do they have any media capabilities? Do they have any um, connections? What can they do with their book? And that's really the fun part of it and where my business coaching background comes into play is is getting to, to do some strategy um, around how are they going to get their book into the hands of the most readers possible? Um, and also, how are they going to get them there? Not just Um, You know how on LinkedIn, when you go to connect with someone, you you look at the profile of someone you're not connected to, and it'll say, this is how you're connected to those other people Yeah. with, with the, the nonfiction books of the people that I work with, what they are um, instructed to do by me is put their books in the hands of those contacts who have those potential readers as their clients. So this is in terms of building relationships with other, other writers or other people that have maybe platforms, not necessarily writers, maybe podcasters or or, or other folks there. Or or other professionals who aren't writers and wouldn't necessarily be writers. And I can give you a quick example. If you're a divorce attorney, you can't go to someone and say, okay, you've been married 20 years. It's time for trader in. (laughs) Let's get you a new wife. (laughs) Right. But when a divorce is happening, the person who's going through the divorce reaches out to their, their closest, um, connection and they say, who do you know who Hmm. could help me to do X? So a divorce attorney is not someone who can instigate a transaction, but very often it's the financial advisor or the corporate attorney or the CPA that gets the call. And I'm telling my clients who are divorce attorneys, write that book and put it in the hands of those strategic partners because you're not you're not connected to your pers- prospective reader, but your connections are. So that once, the, as you start to kind of build up, you talk about the building your list. 
how mm-hmm. do you ensure that you're also the, 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 obviously there was an old expression the power is the power is in your list but then that's people can recognize that's more really the, as you said at the start it's, it's the relationship with that list uh, how do you mm-hmm. go about over a period of time building that relationship with with the list especially when you're talking you're now into maybe multiple books and you maybe have people that are coming at you because they, they've been interested in your writing about one area and they maybe ha- don't know about another part of your writing I, I just tend to be myself in my communications with my list. And so I write them when I have a new book and I write them when something irritates me. (laughs) So (laughs) I write a blog post, like, for example, I have some, I had someone who, who I'm connected with on LinkedIn. I don't know them, but if you ask to connect with me on LinkedIn, I'll look at your profile. And if you don't appear outwardly to be a serial killer, we'll give it a go. And so if we connect on, on LinkedIn and the next thing is, I know that you know this famous person and I want to know this famous person. So can you connect me and my friend? I'm thinking to myself, okay, no, Hmm. yeah, (laughs) no. And I wrote a book about it. I wrote a book on networking called business dating and the opening uh, phrase in the book is when, if I meet you for the very first time and we're on a date, not a business date, but on a social date, right? Like we've seen each other and we're like, Oh, you want to, you look cute. I want to go to coffee with you. If I show up at that date and I go, Hey James, you know what? You're really cute. Would you take off your pants? It's going to be a little bit creepy at that point. It's going to be a little (laughs) bit creepy. It's awkward. And then you're going to know what kind of girl I am. There you (laughs) go. So it's the same thing in business. When someone asks me, um, oh, we've just met. Would you introduce me to Hal? I'm like, um, probably not. <laughs> yeah, it's it's it's, it's, it's the 16 year old, uh, you know, the, the the it's the it's the, 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 the 17 or 18 year old kind of way of dating of thinking about dating, trying to get to Correct. that first base, yeah. as opposed to someone that's uh, that's maybe been a, been around for a little while and understands some things about relationships. Correct. So I take those instances and I write a blog post about them, hmm. and I don't call out the person who's you know, the, I don't call it the offending party, but I send it out to my list and I say, here's what happened. And here's actually how this could be handled better. In case you were thinking of asking someone for the introduction, you have to earn the introduction. You have to give lots of value. And so as part of that, when I'm writing a blog post, when I'm sending out something to my list, I'm sending them things that I've come across that I've found valuable. So here's a book I've read that I found valuable, or here's a podcast I found, or here's an article I found, or here's just a quote, or if you're going through a tough time, why don't you try this? Here's a, you know, here's a strategy. So I'm giving a lot. And it's funny because anyone who's on, who was on my list a couple of weeks ago, I just gave them, you must write a book. I put it up in book funnel. And I just said, if anybody wants the book, you don't even have to write me a review. I just hope you read it. And so then the following week, I sent a blog about something else. And in the PS, I put, by the way, I know I gave you the book. And if you missed it, here's the link. It would be so cool if you would pre-order the book, because that would be so helpful for me. And I got 10 pre-orders that day. So it's, And it, it was just people like that got this, the book for free that did me a solid because I'm human and they like me. And that's where people are connecting. It's in Gary Vaynerchuk wrote the book, Jab, 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 Hook, Right yeah, Hook. Right, yeah. Right. And the jab is the give. So it's like, give, 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 give as much as you can over give. Like I could have said to my whole list, Hey, go buy my book. And they would have bought it. But I had 10 people who bought it just because they wanted to be nice to me, which I thought was pretty cool. But, but, I, guess, I, but, but I guess it's, it's that, you know, that is founded in psychology of reciprocity of us wanting, we're kind of hardwired. If someone gives us something, we kind of want to you know, thank them, you know, and so, yes. and it's like, you know, you know, uh, nonprofit senders like free pens <laughs> all the time and things. Now, obviously that's being done in a kind of not great way. Um, but if it's done with authenticity and, and actually, you know, with, with, a, with a kind of feeling and you genuinely, and, and obviously the reason that you write because you want to help other people, um, right. going through those things right. as well, it's coming from it from a good place. Um, right. you, you're not you're not doing the the 17 year old uh, chat up line instead. So it's uh, it's coming from a good place. Can you can you tell, as you've gone through this this journey as a, as a writer as a, as a creative person, can you tell us about a time when maybe you worked on a project? You maybe it was a book or another a project, and you gave it your heart and your soul, but for whatever reason, it just didn't work out like you'd hoped. And more importantly, what were the lessons that you took away from that experience? 
Oh gosh. So when I published the successful single mom, I was convinced I, this was it. This was my book, James. Oprah was, Oprah is a big champion of the single mom. (laughs) I was going to send the book to Oprah. She was going to get the book. I was going to be on the Oprah show that was going to help all these single moms that were struggling. It was going to be amazing. All of my pain was, you know, not for not right. I had been through it and I was going to help other people. So I, I spent $20,000 on a PR person, oh, bad idea. You have to sell a lot of books to make $20,000. And I had a book launch party and or, ordered a bunch of books, like thousands of books, <laughs> had them in my garage. Um, a friend of mine who was a real estate agent was working on a private development in Las Vegas. And she said, oh, you can use this $10 million home as the setting for your book party. And another friend offered to cater it. And it was, it all was coming together beautifully. And then nothing happened. I sold some books at the, at the book party, but I mean, we literally trucked in like a thousand books. And so we, then we trucked home about 800 books. (laughs) So that wasn't exactly a big win, all things considered. And I still had 4,000 more books in my garage. And, uh, you know, a bunch of people came to the party, I think maybe because they wanted to see the $10 million house. I mean, who wouldn't? Mm -hmm. And um, I always say, like, I had a, a party and nobody came to my party. And some people would say there were crickets, except not even the crickets came. Like, it was literally nothing. And so what I learned from that was a a number of things. Don't order 5,000 copies of your book because they'll end up in your garage. Um, Don't hire a PR person unless you know better what you're doing. And if you do hire someone, make sure that they know what they're doing and and you have proof of that. Um, And then don't expect overnight results because the interesting thing is all of these years later, I can log on to Amazon any day um, of the week and the book will be in the top 20 in its category. So it's the like successful an, it's, thing. it's been an ever, it's become an it's an evergreen because it's te- teaching about an evergreen topic. Correct. <laughs> you know, so it's not going to go I away. Yes, and so here's the thing: where I wasn't a traditional author, but I had that traditional mindset of it had to be a bestseller, and it also had a an expiration date. It's like a pound of beef if you mm. buy it at the grocery store. If you don't use it in a week's time, you have to throw it away. And in my head, I was thinking I only have this short period of time to make this book go. But the truth is, Think and Grow Rich was published almost 100 years ago, and there are still people who have never heard of it, and then they've discovered and they read it, and it's a new book to them. Yeah. And so I didn't have in my head that publishing a book at that time, now I do, is the, is the, is the long game. That it's not, a, it's not a sprint, it's not even a marathon, it's like an, a, a 10 Ironman triathlons back to back, and you just keep going, you just keep putting one foot in front of the other. And once I got that, Once I realized that, like, oh, because I put the book up for sale on Amazon in paperback format, and this is well before Kindle, and this was well before CreateSpace. So I had the physical copies, and I created an Amazon Advantage account, and they ordered their first three books. And I went, (laughs) woohoo! right, three books, you know, only 4,797 to go, (laughs) right? But slowly, I worked my way through that, that order of books because Amazon would order more and more and more and more books. And then Kindle took a more prominent role and I started selling Kindle copies. And then I got the audiobook done. And so now the audiobook sells lots of copies. And so I realized over time that it really is an overtime situation. That if I just keep chipping away at it a little bit, if I'm not trying to run the 100 yard dash in world record speed, I'm still going to get there. I'll get there a few seconds after the winner, but I'm able to keep running. And I'm guessing as you, you, you're continually building your list, as you build that list, as new people are introduced to you and they read that one of the books and then they say, you know, I really enjoy that. What else does this person write? Right. Then you've yes. got, you've got this, this catalog, you've got this, uh, you know, all, all these other things as well. and many of them kind of tie into each other because of your personality, they're they're fall, they're, they're 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 falling for you, for your personality, the, the voice that you you have. I mean, there's obviously there's a uh, someone said to me the other day, um, they were talking about writing a, a marketing related book, and they said, "But well, I want you because there's, you know, there's so many marketing related books out there." I said, "Well, there are, but 
how many people but it's your, not your yours voice. is this your, not right. your voice i mean i think i've got yeah. a, i might have an entire you know uh cupboard of of marketing books because i might like this one and my wife might like this other one because they just like we like different voices and we we yes. like being spoken to in, in a slightly different ways as well so so you're going to have that you you've got these evergreen books that are out there and and in this this creative journey you've had has there been any points where you've had a real kind of insight, a real kind of light bulb moment where you've maybe said, okay, this is maybe a direction I need to be going with my work, with my writing. Um, have there been any of those moments in your life? Oh, sure. Um, well, like with the successful single mom book, I did the cookbook not long after that. And then I put those books away because I thought that they weren't working. And it wasn't until they started to gain momentum that I realized, oh, I could go ahead and write the rest of the books. And I had a, an envelope I had written the six books on or the, I had written five books uh, on the back of an envelope and there were three books yet to be written. And I realized that I still had that envelope and it was still there and I could still write those books. And so I wrote and finished those books. Um, one of the coolest things that ever happened was writing that series and connecting with Hal because I wrote a review for his book. And so, well, I have a, my own personal philosophy has several tenants. And one of the things that I say is if you want something, give it away. Mm. And I realized I wasn't writing reviews. And yet as an author, what do we want more than anything? Reviews, yeah. five star reviews, all of them. Right. Yep. <laughs> so I decided the next book that I read that deserved a four or five star review, I was going to write a review for that book. And, you know, the other part of it is if you don't have something nice to say, then just be quiet. So yeah. if a book was awful, I just don't say anything. I just go on to the next book. So I read The Miracle Morning and I wrote a review for it on on Amazon and Goodreads. And Hal reached out and said, hey, would you consider The Miracle Morning for single moms? Let's talk about it. So we got on the phone and in that conversation decided to partner a book at a time in turning The Miracle Morning into a series. So that's, I spearhead that part of Hal's business is producing those books and working with the co-authors. But it, it was definitely, this is a direction you should go in on a right. Like you have this experience, you have this knowledge. He wants to turn it into a series. He seems like an awfully nice guy. Let's give it a go. And, you know, three and a half years later, we're just about to publish our ninth book together. And so listen to your gut for sure is another, another message. <laughs> and, in there. And this can, this, you know, obviously we're, we're talking some of these things, we're talking about maybe the high, the higher level about things, but yes. when it comes to just the day to day of actually being, you know, of writing, of moving th things, then, you know, then the, I, I was about to use an American, the nine, is it nine yard line. I think that's the American expression. Yeah. I always get mixed right. up with American sports or British sports. The but one anyway, yard line. The, the one, you're the, near the, the one yard yeah, line. Yeah, that, yes, the, the one, one inch, yard to the go. One inch, the one yes. inch line. Um, so when it comes to that, what are some of the habits that, that you have that you, you think that really allow you to you know, produce at this level of consistency and, and also just, you know, you're constantly kind of, you know, producing work? Well, so I'm going to give the standard answer and then I'm going to give the non-standard answer. How's that? Perfect. So we don't say the same thing everyone says. Yeah. The standard answer is I have a writing practice and I write every day from six to seven in the morning because no one is up at six in the morning in my house, right? It's just me. It's me, the coffee maker, the tea maker, <laughs> and sometimes a cat. Um, that's my, my daily practice. The non-standard answer is I say no. That's my default answer. Honoré, would you like to? No. Yeah. How about this? No. <laughs> yeah. I say no a lot. I'm an introvert. I like to stay home. I like to work at home. And so when someone reaches out for, for whatever reason, I, my general answer is no, I might be moved to, and I'll think about it mm. because in order to say yes to getting all the things done that I need to get done, I have to say no to all the incoming. Can we meet for coffee so I can pick your brain? No. <laughs> would, would you like to come to this thing for four days? No, no, I wouldn't because I already have a list a mile long of things that I want to get done. And I am racing against the clock a little bit in my personal life. I have a daughter who's in high school and I want to spend as much time with her as I possibly can before she abandons me for greener pastures. And if I'm out gallivanting or doing things, then my work isn't getting done. Then my work cuts into the evening hours and the weekend hours mm -hmm. and the summer hours and the spring break hours. And so I just know is, is, has become my pretty standard answer. And we are in a guilt ridden society 
a lot of times people feel like, you know, if you're given an opportunity, you have to say yes to it. And I had a very high profile author reach out to me recently. And he said, I love what you've done for Hal. And I want you to do the same thing for me and for my book. And I said, that is just so incredibly lovely. And I'm certainly willing to help you and consult with you, but I'm going to dance with the one I came with and focus on my own stuff. I don't even know where I'd put you if I decided to do it. It's funny. I mean, what you were just saying there, it reminds me, a, a friend of mine, Derek Sivers, um, he he has a uh, he was one of the founders of CD Baby, the the, the, web, the web website for selling records and music, um, and he, he very successful TED talks. And he has an expression which is, "If it's not a hell yes, it's a no." Yes. Um, and he basically says no to the vast majority of things. And then people are really surprised when they reach out to him and he does he says yes to something. He said, "Well, it's cause right. it, it's actually because I really <laughs> want to do it." You know, it's, it's so right. because he says yes to so few so few things. But he said, you know, it's that kind of classic. If it's like a, a one, two, three, four, five, all the way up till eight, probably nine, it's a no. <laughs> and oh. it just and it just gives him so much time to do other things, family, and 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 do the, the kind of work and the deep work that he wants to do as well as a, especially as a, he's an in, very much an, an introvert in that sense. Yes. And so say no, Just <laughs> start say saying no. no to everything, say no to everything. You can always come back and say, yes, we are conditioned to say yes. And then we go, Oh, why did I say yes to that? I wish I would have said no. And then you have to go back and you have egg on your face and you feel bad and the person's mad at you. So it's far better for you to say, no, I'm not available in the last minute call and say, you know, I was thinking it might be a good idea for me to come and do that. And then they're thrilled. Yeah. But if you say I'm absolutely coming in at the last minute, you just are thinking, oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather have a root canal than go to this function. Then it's probably not the right thing. And that allows me to get a ridiculously amount of things done during the day. And my schedule is to the to the minute from the minute my daughter and my husband leave in the morning until the minute they come home in the afternoon, I am running like my pants are on fire. I well, am just whipping through my list so that when they walk through the door, I, I'm done. I don't even have to think about it till tomorrow. Well, talking about lists and, and things like that, do you have any kind of online resources or tools or apps like Evernote that you, that you love? I love Evernote and I love Slack. I communicate with my team in Slack. Great tool. And, and the thing, the rule I have with my team is I'm going to, I'm going to put it in there the minute I think of it. I don't expect you to respond the minute I think of it (laughs) because it'll occur to me at eight o'clock on a Saturday night or two o'clock on a Sunday afternoon or at four 30 in the morning on a weekday when I get up and I'm not expecting instant gratification. I just want to get it out of my head and on someone else's list so I can keep my brain clear and focused. And if you could recommend only one record, what's it, one album and one book to our listeners, what would they be? Like a music album? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, Oh, I don't know this one. I don't have the answer to this one because I have um, I listen to a lot of classical music and I actually started listening not long ago and I don't know the name of the album, but you can Google it. It's like Tchaikovsky or classical music for students. Okay. Like the best, best music to learn by. And so I play that with my headphones on when people are around <laughs> and I'm trying to get work done. I have these big headphones on that basically say go away. <laughs> and I'm listening to classical music because it's been uh, scientifically proven to make you smarter. I don't know if that's true or not, but I think if you believe something, you're 90% of the way there. Exactly. Um, and then and then a book. Um Gosh, I have to do two, so don't shoot me. But the first one is Law of Success by Napoleon Hill, which is the predecessor to Think and Grow Rich, which is really the baby version of Law of Success. Um, It's 1,500 pages. It's fantastic, and I read it pretty consistently and have for about 10 years. Um, And then the other one is Awaken the Giant Within by Tony Robbins. Mm. It's funny. You know, you have those those kind of books that just kind of resonate. um, And and what's what's nice about them is – people will kind of discover them or rediscover them many, many years later. And I think, um, I mean, Awaken the Giant Within is one of those books. And I've got a feeling mm-hmm. that someone like um, Tim Ferriss's Four Hour Work Week, although it may date in some some respects, is going to be one of those uh, as well. Um, mm-hmm. So, with with Napoleon Hill, what is it specifically about the book that you that you want to kind of keep returning to it? It fundamentals. I found that the older I get, 
the more I realized I already had the knowledge, I already had the access to the knowledge and the knowing a long time ago. It's our, our nature, or at least in my nature to go kind of listen to the new person because the new person might've discovered something new. And then I try the new thing and it doesn't quite work. And then I return to the old thing. (laughs) (laughs) The brain change thing syndrome. Yes. Yeah. Well, it, it's, you know, it's like a girlfriend of mine who's 10 years younger. She said, Honore, you're such a cardio bunny. You need to stop that and just lift heavy twice a week. And so I lifted heavy twice a week and then I gained 15 pounds and my pants didn't fit anymore. And it was funny because I realized the program, I was fine before. <laughs> Everything was fine. My pants fit before. <laughs> <laughs> and then I decided to change it in, oh, if I could only work out just two hours a week. Really? Is that a thing? Yes, it's a thing. And I tried it and it didn't work for me. And then when I, like women have this range of pants, right? We've got this, the skinny pants and then we've got the fat pants. And as long as the fat pants fit, you're okay. But the minute <laughs> the fat pants don't fit, you're off the scale. That's bad. And so you have to go the nuclear option and it's very stressful. And I just returned to the fundamentals and that's what Napoleon Hill's book law of successes for me. It's the fundamental. I can go off and I can read other books and I'm a voracious reader and and love that. But I also return to the same tomes again and again and again, because I want to, I I'm a different person this time that I'm reading it than I was the last time or the first time I'm able to, to, to receive the knowledge at a, at a deeper level. And sometimes even really receive it for the first time, even though I thought I had gotten it the last five times I had read it. Well, we'll put all these links here at uh, jamestaylor.me. If people just type in honorary coder, you're going to get all these links as well. So final question, honorary. Let's imagine if you woke up tomorrow morning and had to start from scratch. So you've got all the tools of your trade, uh, you know, as a, as, a, as a writer and the knowledge you've acquired over the years, but no one knows you and you know no one. How mm-hmm. would you restart things? So say that again, who people, I are, I know everything. I just don't know anyone. Yep. So you've got all the tools of your trade. You've got your, your, mm. your, your Mac, all the things you write on, oh, but, yes, the and Mac. you've got your skills that you have now as a writer, but no one knows who you are. They've never heard of you and you don't know anyone. You don't have any of your contacts. You don't have that list that you were talking about earlier. How mm. would you restart? I would go, I would do what I have been doing for the past few years. I'd go make friends and I always show up in a, in a conference or in a conversation over coffee with 10 ideas for the person in charge or the person I'm talking to. So whenever I read someone's book, I'd write down 10 ideas and I just send it to them. I read your book and here are 10 ideas I had for you, 10 things that occurred to me, take it, leave it, burn it, whatever works for you. And I find that doing that, people are blown away by the spirit of generosity and of giving. Mm. And then they can't wait to give something back, but that's not why I do it. It's just how my brain works. Yeah, when I'm helpful. reading, I want to be helpful. And that's how my, and that's how I'm wired is, oh, here's what, here's something that occurred to me when I was reading your book about how you could get this book in the hands of people you never even thought of. And so I write a little paragraph about it. Well, and so I show up with a document or a note or I send an email. And so that's what I would do is I would go and make friends with the cool kids, right? <laughs> <laughs> who are the cool kids? Well, who are the influencers? Who are the people that have influence that you also like because you don't make friends with someone that you don't like just to use them? That's rude. But I, I genuinely, when I'm a fan of someone, I want to make friends with them because they're cool. And as a byproduct of that, they are influencers and they're helpful. But I think what's interesting there is is you're going to them with being helpful, but being spe- being specific <laughs> with the help rather than just go with a, an adoring email of just saying, I just, I love your work. Um, uh, you're actually going and actually being helpful. And th- th- they may just reject all the points that you've, you've come with, but the fact that you've thought and you've, you've thought about how to be helpful and how to add value to them. Um, I think it says, it says a lot about you and it's obviously one of the reasons why uh, you're such a, a kind of loved uh, writer and why people really enjoy reading your books. And Honor, it's been a great pleasure having you on the show today. What's the best way for listeners to connect with you to learn about your books, the new book that's coming out and, and, and your speaking gigs? Well, so they can go to honorayquarter.com and all the info is on there. I'm also at, uh, at Honoré on all social media. So uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all the places. <laughs> <laughs> so come and say hi. 
Well, I, I highly encourage everyone to come and say hi to Honoring. And uh, thank you so much for, for coming on the show today. I wish you all the best with the, the new book. Hope to, to catch up with you in person, either on this side of the pond or over on your side of the pond. Oh, I would love it. Please do. I look forward to it as well. Thanks so much, James. Hey, James Taylor here again. And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.